I'm going to start by saying how utterly lovely it is to be here with you all. Let's be honest, the last, well, 17, 18, 19 months, they've been a bit shit really, haven't they? And it is an absolute joy to be back at a proper conference rather than talking to people on Teams or Zoom or Skype, etc. Anyway, I'm here today to talk to you about death, demons and debriefing. Why? Because I think it really matters. We do this job because we want to try and make a difference to patients, to try and do our best, but we can't save them all. And I think this concept was something I only really came to later in my career because, let's be honest, how often in our operating theatres, I am an anaesthetist, do we have a death on the table? Or in our emergency department, how many patients die in the recess bay? For those of you who are out on the road, how many patients can you not get to hospital alive? And it was when I first went to Afghanistan that I recalibrated this. Because it's not often in my normal job that people are actually trying to die on me. And it's not often in my normal job in London that I have a bad outcome. But we've all got patients we remember. We've all got jobs we remember more than others. And sometimes it's not because it was a great save. It was because we couldn't save a life. And again, we're here to try and make a difference, to do our best. But sometimes our best isn't enough due to the catastrophic nature of the patient's illness or injuries. This young man was blown up by an improvised explosive device in Afghanistan. At the time, I was flying in the Chinook helicopter out to the front line as part of the medical emergency response team to pick up the most severely wounded casualties and try and get them back to the hospital. This chap had both legs blown off above the knee and severe pelvic floor trauma. As we later discovered, you could put his hand up through his pelvic floor and touch the cross clamp on his aorta that was stopping him from bleeding to death. From our point of view, this was a textbook job. Nothing could have gone better. But he died on the operating table because at the time, that degree of injury, complete destruction of the pelvic floor was unsurvivable. And care was withdrawn. It hit us all really hard. And the outcome of the debrief and the clinical governance meeting where all deaths were discussed was that shit happens. But we looked after each other. We looked out for each other. We were kind to ourselves and we were kind to each other. And it was again in Afghanistan where I really learned the benefit of a debrief. And we're talking about a, a technical debrief, not a sort of fluffy psychological debrief, because we know they're not actually particularly good for people. This is a British actor called Bob Hoskins, and he appeared in a series of uh, advertisements for British Telecom. And the tagline was, it's good to talk. And so a debrief can be hot, happening soon after the event, or it can be cold, happening further away in time. But it's really, really important to get that debrief done because it is good to talk. Debriefs help us make sense of what happened. They help us process what happened. And they can help us identify things we need to do differently next time, whether for better or for worse. But there can be some real barriers to debrief. Finding the time to do it. You know, if you're having a busy day, you may not be able to do a hot debrief immediately after that job or after that patient or after that cardiac arrest. We work in a hierarchical organization, a lot of us. And the seniority, the person leading the debrief, how they go into it can make a massive difference as well. Some people feel they can't speak freely. They're scared of what their colleagues might think. Let's be honest, we all want to be seen as a, as a good person, not as a bad person. And extreme emotion can derail a debrief as well. And I'll come back to that in a bit. And so whoever is leading the debrief needs to set ground rules. And I think the really important thing is that, that debriefs need to become normal. They need to become part of our normal practice. A debrief doesn't mean something has gone wrong or somebody's made a mistake because we can learn from excellence too. And if debriefs just become normal, people go into them feeling able to be more open and to discuss things more freely. Now, I really like this, as, and this is what I try and get done before a hot debrief, is a team check. Is everyone okay? Has everybody imbibed? Have they had something to eat? 
Have they had something to drink? And really importantly, have they been to the loo? Equipment resupply always needs to happen before a debrief starts. Because what happens if you get another shout whilst you're in the middle of the debrief and you're missing half your airway kit because you've just used it? Or the crash trolley hasn't been restocked because you've got another cardiac arrest coming in when you were debriefing the last one. And then you get into the actual debrief itself. And there is, this is a sort of structure I keep in my head, rather like Penella's structure for her M&M &M meetings. I think having a structure gives us a hook to hang the debrief on. Facts, and it's definitely facts. It's what happened. And the F can also be for feelings. Because there's nothing wrong with discussing feelings. The, when X happened, I felt Y. When you did A, I thought B. There's nothing wrong with feelings coming into a debrief. And I think that level of openness about being able to share how something made you feel is actually really important in small teams. But what can really derail a debrief is extreme emotion. We had a catastrophic airway incident in our day surgery unit where I work about 18 months ago. That kind of bad stuff does not happen in ambulatory care. And some of the more junior staff were really, really upset by it. And the debrief could have been derailed by the fact that they were so upset they spent the debrief sobbing, crying. So how do you deal with that if you're leading the debrief? Because that extreme emotion can really derail the debrief. And sometimes you have to take suggest that the person pops out and that you catch up with them a bit later and update them on the outcome of the debrief. The analysis. It is what happened, but it's also really helpful to think about what you thought was going to happen. And if the two differed, why was that? And it's really important that you look at the process rather than the actual outcome. And we always have to balance the team with the individual. Again, more us, less me. And in the summary that comes, this is a great opportunity to go around the room and ask if anybody who hasn't spoken up has anything they wish to say or anything they think has been missed. And then ultimately, ask the group for the take homes. What's important to, for them to take out of this debrief? It might be a bit of reading they need to do. You might be able to suggest a, an educational resource for them. You might need to write up an adverse incident report or indeed an excellence report. But also, it's a good opportunity in the take homes to signpost anything they might need in the future. Because this debrief hasn't been about the psychological aspects of it. But people may well need support further down the line, particularly if it's after a major incident where there have been multiple deaths. I love this quote. It's Ernest Hemingway. When people talk, listen completely. Most people never listen. And if you're going in to lead the debrief, or indeed to be part of it, go into the meeting with a positive attitude and listen actively. How often are we truly present? How often are you distracted by your Apple Watch tapping your wrist when you get a text message? Or the ping on your computer when an email comes into your inbox? I do wonder if an element of that is lockdown, is that people sit on their sofa and you can pause Netflix, or you can turn your camera off in a Teams meeting and do whatever you want by the side. But I think listening actively is so important. You need to be attentive, ask open-ended questions or probing questions. Clarify if you need to. You know, what, what did you mean by that? Paraphrase and be attuned to and reflect the feeling in the room. I cannot emphasize this enough. Be kind. I can guarantee if somebody has made a mistake, they will be being far harder on themselves than anybody else can be. They will be beating themselves up big time. I think it can be quite tempting. Well, I wouldn't have done it like that. I'd have done it like this. Not helpful. If you weren't in the ditch with the patient who's been ejected from the car, if you weren't in that firefight, if you weren't part of the team trying to turn a 150 kilo COVID patient from prone to supine because they're about to arrest when the ET tube came out, think very seriously before you speak and ensure you are adding value.
after a significant event, particularly if there's been a bad outcome, we need to be kind to ourselves, but we also need to be really kind to each other. As I said, we've all got patients we remember more than others. And we probably remember those that died more though than those that lived. And I refer to them as my demons. I've got plenty of them, I suspect you have too. And as time goes on, you know, the demons are in a box, the lid fits more and more snugly. But demons are feisty little buggers. And sometimes they really love to come out to play, which can be quite a surprise. I was sitting in a friend's garden in RAF Benson. It was a spectacular sunset. And it was a perfect night for night flying. And I, had, I could hear a Chinook helicopter. There's such a distinctive noise down on the flight line getting ready to launch. I had flown out into so many spectacular sunsets, knowing that someone was waiting for me and they were having the very, very worst day of their life, as were their teammates. And sounds are so powerful for triggering emotions and memories. You know, you might hear a song and you know exactly where you were when you first heard it. And that night, my demons were rampant. Because for some, the sound of the Chinook was a sound of salvation. It was a sound of safety, it was a sound of help. But it wasn't for others, because I couldn't save them all. I acknowledge my demons. They've made me the person and the clinician I am today. I genuinely couldn't save them all. Didn't mean I'd made a mistake. Didn't mean I'd done something wrong. I had done my absolute best. But sometimes our best is not enough. But I knew I'd done my best and I was able to take comfort from that. I could have done no more. And some people say, well, why haven't you got PTSD? Well, I know. I wish I did. I've got colleagues who'll never work again because their PTSD is so bad. And I'm not going to use the word resilient. Am I more resilient than other people? I doubt it. We're all, aren't we, drawn from a population, so we're probably somewhere along a bell curve in terms of how we can process bad events or indeed how some people suffer. Resilient, just not a good word to use for people. I think systems can be resilient. People, not so much. It's often used as a stick to beat people with. Oh, you're struggling with that. Oh, it's because you're not resilient enough. And no amount of yoga classes or mindfulness apps at discounted rates are free or for free are probably going to sort that out. What will help is knowing you did your best and you could have done no more. And I think that has never been more relevant than in the NHS in the last 19 months with COVID. As I said, it's been a bit shit really, hasn't it? I made the move across to intensive care in the second wave of COVID at home. And I have to say, I was a very reluctant intensivist, but they were desperate. They needed as many sort of warm, hot bodies as they could have to help run our units. We doubled our bed capacity in the space of a couple of weeks. Went from 67, then to 98, and up to 150 beds. And we had ITU patients all over the place in theater recovery. You know, it's amazing how long you can use an anesthetic machine for as a ventilator rather than as an anesthetic machine. And it was not NHS intensive care as we knew it. We were not doing our gold standard. You know, we had patients all over the place. We were using anesthetic machines as ventilators. Rather than the one-to-one -one nursing, we had one ITU nurse looking after four patients in a space where there would previously have been two. The other nurses were from tissue viability, from chemotherapy, uh, from the outpatient bariatric service. This was not normal. But you know what? Everybody did their best. They could have done no more. And I think people got quite a lot of comfort out of that. Sure, it wasn't their normal best, but these were very strange times. And hopefully we won't get a repeat this winter. We'll see. So in addition to the formal debrief, I think reflecting on our, our practice day to day is hugely important. And it's something I quite often do when I'm cycling home. It sort of marks the end of the day. And I don't know how many of you are aware of this concept of the critical friend. This is somebody we trust enough to tell us when we're getting it wrong. Particularly if we're breaking rule one. Are you all familiar with rule one? Just don't be a dick. 
<laughs> and it applies really well to life and, and to medicine. So having that person who can say, actually, Kate, you really shouldn't have done that. You sounded, uh, you just shouldn't have done that. It's a bit like the Jaws moment versus the Deeply Diffy from Right Said Fred. And that critical friend will help you see your strengths, whereas a critic will probably point out your flaws. And a critical friend will try and drive you forward rather than making you hang back and look at whatever went wrong. And a critical friend will probably make you smile rather than frown. And a critical friend will probably bring you joy rather than making you want to swear. So debriefs, reflecting with that critical friend and learning lessons are so important. This is known as the magic unicorn slide. And this is the rainbow colored mane of that mythical beast. And what it plots is the new injury severity score versus probability of survival. And each of those colored lines is a, is a different year in our 10 years uh, data that was gathered in Afghanistan. And what you can see as time went on, we had more and more patients survive, particularly those with an injury severity score of 75. Statistically, they're supposed to die because their injuries are so severe. But when they live, they become what we call unexpected survivors. As you can see, that number went up and up and up every year. But that's because we worked in a culture where debriefs were the norm, where we were prepared to learn the lessons from every patient, whether it was a, you know, a, a lesson of good practice from excellence or a lesson where something had gone wrong and it was a hard lesson to learn. Towards the end of the conflict in Afghanistan, Camp Bastion was a leading trauma center in the world. And 97.8% of patients who arrived at the hospital with a pulse survived. So, in summary, don't be afraid of the debrief. Incorporate it and make it part of your normal practice. Be prepared to learn the lessons, however easy or hard they are. We've all got demons. Acknowledge them. And remember, you know what? It is okay to be okay. And if you need to reach out for help and support, please do. Thank you.